Life can come in many different forms, from a microscopic bacterium to a 2,000-year-old sequoia tree, and of course, to you and me. And although there are some apparent disparities in the forms and functions of life, there are seven unifying characteristics that all life forms share, including the ability to grow and change, the ability to maintain homeostasis, the ability to pass traits onto their offspring. But most importantly, all living organisms have the ability to adapt to their environments. And these adaptations are driven by a natural and instinctual need for survival. And this instinct to survive is what drives the actions and the behaviors of all living organisms on the planet. That is, except one. As far as we can understand, humans are actually the only living organisms that have conscious control over their actions, their behaviors, and most importantly, their adaptations. As humans, we can make decisions. We can take initiative in certain situations. We can be persistent, and we can be incredibly resourceful. And whether we recognize it or not, this idea is universal and plays a role in our everyday lives. And although we have this incredible ability to maintain conscious control over our adaptations, sometimes when we are placed in situations that force us to grapple with serious issues, we have a tendency to react and not to adapt. And there is a subtle yet significant difference between these two responses. When we react, a lot of the times, it can be driven by emotion and irrationality. And if these situations could lead to dire consequences, it can lead to hopelessness. But if we adapt, if we modify our actions and our behaviors based on our circumstances, we can move forward. In order to live, we must adapt. And this is an idea that I do hold with me every single day because it has the potential to allow us to leverage our experiences, whether positive or negative, into meaningful opportunity. And this idea has led me here to share my story with you. So I was born and raised in New Hampshire in a town called Wyndham. Maybe you've heard of it. And in Wyndham and in New Hampshire, we like to live very active lifestyles. So I played outside all the time. I built a tree fort in my backyard with my dad and my brother. And this active lifestyle, you know, we had a lot of fun. Um, so one summer night, I came in from playing, and I realized that I had this acute pain right in my left ankle, right in the joint. And I was a little uh, worried, and you know, I didn't really know what was going on. Uh, so as it persisted a couple days, I mentioned it to my parents. I knew I hadn't fallen or anything, and they said, maybe it's just Lyme disease. You know, if it's persisted, it's possible that I could have gotten a tick bite, and that's kind of a common way to get Lyme disease. Unfortunately, it proved to be a symptom, and it actually persisted over the next couple days and weeks. The joint pain actually exacerbated itself, and it began to rotate strangely around my body. So it started in my left ankle, but then a couple days later, it would be my right shoulder, and I would have very limited range of motion in my shoulder. And then a couple days later, it would be in my hip, and then I would have issues walking. And then a couple days later, it would be in my other foot. And in addition to the joint pain, I was experiencing very significant fatigue over these weeks. And at the time, I was 16, I was a sophomore in high school, so this was kind of interfering with my classes. Hobbling my way from class to class was actually making me late, so I needed to get a hall pass so I wouldn't get in trouble. But as the uh, symptoms actually persisted, I uh, began to see a couple more doctors to figure out what was going on, and they were able to identify that this had something to do with some sort of inflammation. Uh, so in order to combat that, I was actually placed on a very high dose of steroids, which is a pretty common regimen in these situations. Unfortunately, the high dosage actually caused me to gain 40 pounds over the course of a month. And, you know, that was about a third of my weight at the time, so that was pretty significant, as you can imagine. So after seeing a lot of different specialists and going on a couple different tests, 
I ended up being diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease called Wegener's granulomatosis. So six-year-old me had no idea what that even meant. So I looked it up and I learned that it's a disease where your immune system basically turns on you and attacks itself. Wegener's, oh, and in that way, it actually manifests in the form of inflammation of the blood vessels of your vasculature. And this can actually restrict blood flow to many major organs, in this case, prominently in the kidneys and lungs. Wegener's only uh, presents itself in the population in three out of every 100,000 people. But most interestingly, it actually only presents itself on average uh, in an age range between 45 and 60. So it was a little strange that 16-year-old me was presenting with this disease. Most importantly, though, if Wegener's goes undiagnosed and untreated, it's fatal. So once we realized how serious this issue was, I began to see a lot of different doctors in Boston. I went on a couple of different medication regimens, including some chemotherapies. I was required to have a couple of different surgeries in order to treat the symptoms of my disease and I saw a lot of different specialists, as I mentioned. So I saw you know, nephrologists, otolaryngologists, ophthalmologists, rheumatologists, you needed a guy, I had a guy. But at 16, this was causing me some pretty significant mental and physical consequences. And I would be lying if I said I wasn't really scared about what I thought this disease could mean for me and my future. And although I didn't have, at this time in my life, a big crystallizing moment as a 16-year-old, through the support of my friends and family, I came to the understanding that this was a situation in which I needed to adapt and not react. If I were to passively react to this situation, I probably would have been led down a negative path, and it would have done me no good. My circumstances were outside of my control, and I needed to accept the fact that I was going to be required to adapt. I wanted to be able to leverage my experience into opportunity. And this persistence led me down a road of scientific discovery. At the time, as I mentioned, I was in high school and I was interested in science and math and engineering. So I found that there is you know, a bridge that existed because I was actually gaining a lot of experience in the medical field that not all other people were. I was meeting with doctors pretty regularly. I was interacting with medical technology. I was having a lot of clinical experiences that not many other 16-year-olds were having. And I realized that this could be a window of opportunity for me. I could use my experience and leverage it as a patient into meaningful opportunity. I ended up looking into a new field that had been coming up uh, in the time called biomedical engineering, where biology, medicine, and engineering collide. If I were to leverage my experience into any meaningful field, I thought this could be a great way to do it as a patient, and I could follow this in the realm of biomedical research. At the time in high school, I actually recently had done a project on this new technology where scientists were taking commercial inkjet printers off the shelf, putting in living cells to the cartridges, and then printing out living tissue constructs, which is crazy and ridiculous, right? So as soon as I heard that that was even possible, I was like, wow, this field is super cool. I want to get involved in this. So at that time, I wanted to take initiative. I wanted to turn my adaptation into action. I had a uh, meeting with one of my doctors as a normal checkup, and I just happened to mention to him at that time, I might be looking into research, would you happen to know anyone who is looking for some extra help? I could be an extra pair of hands in the lab, I wouldn't need to get paid, and uh, um, I could get some valuable research experience. And it turned out it was really as easy as that. A week later, he responded, and I ended up working for an entire summer in a biomedical research lab down in Boston. So I was gaining this experience in biomedical research, but also learning the value of taking initiative and adapting to my circumstances. And the research was very, very fun, but I realized that I wanted to persist a little bit more. I wanted to be on the cutting edge. And that idea of that printer that was printing cells was still sticking around in my mind. 
So at that time, um, I was going to college. I ended up pursuing biomedical engineering at Boston University, where I could further pursue my interest in biomedical science. And during that time, I was still experiencing all of the basic tenets of my disease. So I was seeing all of my Boston-based specialists. I was going on monthly infusions of a chemotherapy drug. And I was still having a couple different surgeries to treat my disease, uh, including some surgeries on my throat and also on my eye. And these surgeries, that, those experiences were actually getting me interested in fueling my passion for a very specific part of biomedical engineering called tissue engineering. And in tissue engineering, scientists actually have the idea of trying to replicate native tissue function that we all have in our normal bodies in the lab for a variety of different applications. So when I realized that tissue engineering was what I wanted to do, at least at that time, I, again, wanted to take initiative. So at BU, as a freshman, I just started making friends. I tried to figure out where were the tissue engineering people were working at BU. And through some mutual connections and some friends that I made with upperclassmen, I actually ended up getting a job as a freshman in a tissue engineering lab in the College of Engineering, where I spent all four years in undergrad conducting research on tissue engineering. Uh, and again, it was teaching me that you know, maybe being a little bit uh, persistent and taking initiative in these small situations can lead me along an interesting path that I probably would have never actually followed previously. And within tissue engineering, I still had that idea of printing cells, and I didn't, that really never left my mind. So as a senior, I knew that I wanted to get involved with 3D bioprinting. And at the time, I was getting ready to apply to jobs, so I actually found a company that was taking some of the initial work in bioprinting to market. They were commercializing this research technique. And unfortunately, although I took initiative and I was persistent, I called, I emailed, maybe they were too young of a company, but it ended up being that they never really got back to me, so that ended up being a dead end. However, along my path, I actually ended up connecting with a friend and a mentor from school who happened to know a lab at Harvard that was uh, pioneering this technique of 3D bioprinting in an academic setting. And that was something that I was more than open to. So I ended up pursuing that route and meeting with some people in the lab. Uh, and luckily, I was able to get an interview with uh, the professor who ran the lab and was able to secure a job out of graduation in this lab at Harvard University and at the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. Uh, the lab is uh, run by material scientist Professor Jennifer Lewis, uh, and the Lewis Research Group at Harvard actually last year was named one of the top 10 uh, breakthrough technologies by MIT Technology Review for their work in microscale 3D printing, including bioprinting. So I wanted to actually share with you some of the most recent advances that the Lewis Group has made in this realm of bioprinting because, honestly, I just think it's incredible and actually pretty powerful. So what you'll see here is a video of a tissue construct being created before your eyes. This specifically is a blood vessel construct. So what you're seeing is multiple different nozzles depositing multiple different materials in a predetermined geometry. The idea is that the materials being deposited are biocompatible, and they're actually impregnated with living cells. So since this is a blood vessel tissue construct, they are impregnated with the same kind of cells that are present in your blood vessels. And in addition to being able to place them in these unique geometries, they actually have the ability to function as an actual blood vessel. So as you can see in this video, uh, the tissue construct is actually successfully perfused with a liquid, just like a blood vessel. And although this is years away from being implanted into someone or any immediate therapeutic application, we certainly believe in the group that with further development of this blood vessel model, it could certainly act as a platform for drug screening uh, and also potentially could be used to inform various different disease physiologies. Maybe you remember a disease earlier today uh, that manifests itself in the form of blood vessels. So that could be one example. And based on the power of this research, I think just based on those videos and what I've explained, I think you can understand why I was drawn to this field. And in my mind, this was pretty much as close to the cutting edge of biomedical research as I could get. 
So although my entire path and my journey was initiated by my diagnosis and by my, by my disease, I was always being reminded of the fact that I was required to adapt and not to react in my situation. These adaptations and the persistence that came with my adaptations was what led me along this path that I would have never followed had it not been for my initial set of circumstances. So whether you are young and you have a lot of life experiences ahead of you, or you're old and you have a lot of life experiences behind you that you've learned and grown from, never take for granted the fact that you can always adapt. And this is more than just making the best out of your situations. It's about constantly and consciously reevaluating your circumstances and your situations to allow yourself to modify your behaviors to move forward. So what I leave you with today for my talk is the idea that you can always adapt. After all, it's only natural. Thank you.